special thing. And college experiences shape us throughout the course of our lives. You've committed Interfaith Youth Corps to this work. And I'm wondering, Ibu, for those of us that are committed to this gift and this promise of higher education, uh, we know that there's an awakening that can happen during that time of our lives. Could you share more about your own college experience and how it impacted you to start Interfaith Youth Corps? Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. So, you know, it, in September, I'm often on three or four college campuses, right, right kind of bang at the beginning, even by this time during the month. And I always say to, to students I talk to, there's nothing like fall on a college campus, right? Because there's such a sense of possibility. And although I'm like so grateful for my life, like I would trade places with an, with an 18 year old on a campus, right? The, I mean, the world is absolutely before you and, and, and it's totally disorienting and it's so precious and wonderful at the same time. Uh, uh, and it, my college experience was so, so shaping. And I write about this like literally in every book that, that, I, that I've written and, and I'm writing another book right now uh, about what it looks like to build an institution. And, and I'll tell a story that I haven't shared previously that, that was shaping for me that I'm gonna share in this upcoming book that I'm writing. So when I was a, a third year student, my final year at the University of Illinois, I did an independent study on critical theory with an African-American female professor I uh, a great admiration for. She was cross-listed in education and theater. And we read Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire and Augusta Boal, and I kind of, it was kind of the canon, right? Uh, uh, um, in, and I, you know, I had passing references to these writers and, you know, kind of uh, edited volumes in my other sociology courses, but I, you know, we focused it on actual books this time. And she kept on over the course of our, of our independent study, encouraged me to get to the kind of uh, the ways forward that these writers would highlight. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to do that. Like I only wanted to like, to emphasize the first half of the book, the things that were wrong, right? Uh, what, what the banking model of education as uh, as Paulo Freire calls it, but not what it took to like actually engage, uh, to, to do excellent education at the grassroots level, which he also discusses in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I only wanted to emphasize what was wrong. And because this professor of mine was, was also in the theater department, she had a graduate class at the time where she had uh, written a play with her graduate students uh, from the pers uh, of family life from the perspective of a child. And she asked me to come to this play. And so you know, I'm there at the, you know, at the, in the kind of previews and there were maybe 50 people in the audience and there was a, a Q and A session afterwards. And I stood up, I was the first person who st stood up and I did a first half of the book thing and I just crit critiqued the play. Just like, you know, like top 10 things that were wrong with it. And these, these theater students who were like three years older than me, five years older than me, right? Like they had put together a play in the course of a semester. They'd written it, they'd figured out how to direct it, they'd put it up on stage and they just like stared at me. Like, like really? And when, when my professor sent me an email afterwards, she said, it's not that the points that you made didn't have some validity but why did you choose to see our play with those eyes, mm -hmm. right? And in reading this email, I thought to myself, like, what a wonderful metaphor, what, what a striking metaphor. Did I wanna be the kind of person who put something imperfect on the stage or did I wanna be the kind of person who sat in the audience looking for things that were wrong? Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, of course, it's just 25 years later. And so that story, the, the role it plays in my consciousness now is much more formed and shaped than, than it was when it first happened, right? Like I knew like what had happened, like that kind of exchange and that experience was, um, was kind of a, a crucible moment, but I kind of hadn't figured out exactly how it was yet. But I think it was, it kind of nudged me over the line of, did I want to be the kind of person who puts something imperfect on the stage or, or sat in the audience literally looking for things wrong? And I'll tell you how that connects with, with IFYC uh, um, is, you know, I, I continue to be for, for years afterwards, like, like principally a, a what, what's wrong with the world type of person, right? 
And I did that as I got involved in interfaith work. And so I would go to these interfaith conferences in the 1990s, uh, when I was in the late 90s, when after I graduated from college, I was, you know, started to get interested in this work. And most of the people, you know, they were basically um, fancy affairs at nice hotels where older white male theologians sat on panels. Yeah. And I just lit into it. Like I would just stand up from the, from the floor, like this 21 year old kid with my hair on fire and I'd shake my fist and I'd be like, you're too old, you're too white, you're too male, you're too boring, like all this stuff, right? And I was like, you need more young people, you need more diversity, you need more social action, you need more edginess, you need more passion. And I remember this woman named Yolan Trevino, who's at a conference uh, uh, of, the, of the United Religions Initiative at Stanford, in 1998, June of 1998, an indigenous Mayan woman kind of walks up to me and she says, hey, that's a, that's a really good idea. Like interfaith work focused on young people and diversity and social action that's passionate, and edgy. So really, you, you want to build that. <laughs> and I, I sat, I thought about that and it, it hadn't occurred to me that somebody should build this, right? And that person may be me. And it's a whole different thing to build something mm -hmm. than to critique it. It's a mm -hmm. whole different thing. Mm -hmm. I love uh, when you talk about college, university, campus life, what's happening. And as we know, right now, for a variety of different reasons, the entire world of higher education is being disrupted from COVID-19 to political dysfunction, to race, it, racial injustice, the list goes on. And yet in the midst of disruption or in the midst of crisis, it can give birth to clarity and it can compel us to action. And one of those things right now that nearly across the country everyone's talking about is matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the many things I appreciate about, about your work is helping to ensure that religion, spirituality, secularity, moral, ethical conversations and development is included within that broader conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Why do you think religion and spirituality so often gets left out of that yeah. conversation? And how do you think it can be brought into that conversation? Yeah, so, uh, um, you know, we just did a major study on this and m maybe your wonderful colleague, Alex, who's behind the scenes, they're working all kinds of magic. If, if, if Alex, okay. if you just Google IFYC and ideals, I-D-E-A-L-S, you'll come up with a website of our, of this major study we just released, uh, which is the, probably the most ambitious study of religious diversity in higher education that was ever done. It was in partnership with Dr. Matt Mayhew at Ohio State and Dr. Alyssa Bryant Rockenbach at, at North Carolina State. Uh, um, it was over the course of five years, 120 campuses, north of 20,000 students. And amongst the things that we found was that uh, when you ask students what, what they focused on in terms of diversity in college, 75% of students said that they spent a lot of time on race, 70, uh, around 70% 70 said they spent a lot of time on nationality. North of 60% said that they spent a lot of time on sexuality, uh, uh, a considerable amount of time on political diversity. When you ask about religious diversity, everything is under the 50% mark, right? So less than 50% of students say that they spent significant time studying Muslims or evangelicals or Catholics or Jews or Buddhists or Hindus or Latter-day Saints. And you look at this, we have it on our, on our uh, study, we have it, you know, everything above 50% is blue and everything below 50%, all these religious communities is orange. I, I stared at that chart. You'll be able to find it in the study. And I'm like, boy, that orange, the Muslims and the Christians, that, that represents about 6 billion people right. that, that college students say that they're not spending significant time they're learning about, passing references, right? Um, that's not good, right? Uh, what's right. striking is that the interest is there. So another interesting data point in the study, 70% of students said that they know that bridging religious divides is important. Only 26% said that they've taken a class that focuses on religious diversity. 
less than 15% say that they've been involved in an in interfaith dialogue or an interfaith uh, service project. Um, wow. Right, so there's a gap there. There's a gap there. Uh, uh, here's one of the ways I think about this. You know, one of like my, my kind of, uh, if, I was at, if I was with you at Syracuse, here's the question that I would ask, like virtually every staff and student. I'd say, in your first year orientation, right, the three or four days on campus where the newly matriculated students are hearing from the university what it is about. That is the time when the university says to the students, this is what we are about. How much time is given over to diversity issues? And, you know, everywhere, you know, from like Washington University to Amherst to Illinois State, people say to me about 50%. We spend about 50% of our time in first year orientation on diversity issues. And then I say, how long do you spend on religious diversity? And then there's a long silence. <laughs> and I think what that silence is, is the combination of almost none, and that is not good. Right? Why is this? Um, I mean, in some ways, it's just, it's just nuts. If you think about the role that religious diversity plays in American civic life, right? I mean, like, you know, Syracuse is started by Methodists, yep. right? Uh, uh, 230 colleges and universities in America are started by Catholics. Uh, something like half of our private colleges and universities were started by religious communities. Robert Putnam says that half of American civic life is founded by religious communities. You know, G.K. Chesterton says America is a nation with the soul of a church, right? We're the most religiously diverse nation in human history, the most religiously devout nation in the Western Hemisphere. Religion really matters, right? We break out, uh, we, we, we know how much religion matters in politics, right? We talk about, you know, 81% of white evangelicals voting for Trump, for example. If you are a doctor and you, or a nurse or a respiratory therapist, and you don't know that Buddhists have a different definition of death than mainline Protestants, you cannot do your job well. If you work for the Red Cross or for, you know, a disaster relief for the city of Houston, the vast majority of the volunteers you work with, the vast majority are part of religious communities. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we taught at IFYC, we talk about uh, interfaith leadership as having a vis vision, knowledge base, and skill set to positively engage with religious diversity. And what we say is, you cannot be an educated person. You cannot be a competent professional. You cannot be a, an effective citizen without at least interfaith literacy, at least some measure of vision, knowledge base, and skill set when it comes to religious diversity. So why college campuses aren't leaned into this in the way that, you know, Look, I don't think religious diversity is more important than race or gender or sexuality, but I don't think it's less important either. And the, what I want to remind our viewers again, whether you're on the Zoom platform or whether you're on Facebook Live, if you've got some questions or comments for Ibu, please just type them on in. Our staff from Hendricks Chapel will get those to me and I will do my best to get those to him. So again, type them into the comments, whether you're directly here on Zoom with us or you're on Facebook, uh, those will somehow get to me and I will somehow get them to Ibu. So, Ibu, I, I, I've heard you speak at various Lutheran conferences before. And so me as a Lutheran minister, I have to throw the Lutheran question um, out there. Um, one of the things I love about my own tradition is paradox, this both and reality. And I think about your work, the work we do at Hendricks Chapel, that you can be both and, both rooted in a particular tradition and open yeah. to the traditions of others. And you've embodied that, as you've mentioned, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, of, out of my own Lutheran tradition. How is it that for you, as an American Muslim, find inspiration from a German Lutheran? I mean, you know, Bonhoeffer is, is like a deeply held, like I, I, like I get misty eyed when I talk about Bonhoeffer, right? I, I remember seeing the Martin Niemöller film on him uh, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, and just like this studious, 
German aristocrat whose parents are like, why would you go into the clerk? Are you crazy? You know, coming to Union Theological Seminary, getting involved in uh, uh, churches in Harlem, right? And, and just feeling this deep call to, to articulate an altern like a kingdom-based alternative to the madness of Nazism. And, and in this like quiet, studious way, right? This is one of the things that I think strikes me so much about people of faith is like, you know, it struck me about people involved in the Catholic worker. It struck me about people I've met in ashrams in India. It strikes me about people I've met who were in the Muslim youth movement in, in South Africa in the struggle there against the apartheid. Uh, it's just this kind of quiet sense of I walk the path that God lights. And why would you expect me to do anything different but put my life on the line to oppose Hitler? Isn't this the most obvious thing in the world, right? And so in Bonhoeffer's the kind of theology, right, he, he articulates around it, uh, uh, um, the cost of discipleship, right? The confessing church, uh, um, his line uh, after a particularly ugly foray of Nazis into Jewish neighborhoods, uh, those who did not speak up for the Jews do not deserve to sing Gregorian chants. I mean, that is like a line that should haunt you, haunt, haunt any of us who say we believe in God as we go to sleep, right? That, that there is a justice requirement that precedes the privilege of worship, mm -hmm. right? Those who did not stand up for the Jews do not deserve to sing Gregorian chants. Like if I had to choose a single line that expressed what faith, what the, what, what, what faith, meant in the 20th century that would be like near the top of my list it's got justice in there it's got it's got a commitment to another people in there it's got your own uh tradition in there and it's got it all in the right order right mm -hmm. your tradition calls you to stand up for another people and yeah. that is what allows you to worship worship is a privilege worship is a privilege we have a question that just came in. Uh, Pastor Tara Lamont Eastman has written in, uh, Ibu, what has been one of the most powerful experiences in building bridges across the religious spectrum? How did it impact you as well as relationships and the community? So it's what has been one of the most powerful experiences in building bridges across the religious spectrum? Thank you, yeah, Tara. Thank you. So, it's, a, it's a great question. Thank, thank you for that, Pastor Tara. So, you know, I'll, um, I'll go back to a formative experience for me. This, is, this happens after uh, my second year in college. I'm, I'm on the road, like somehow I convince the campus honors program at the University of Illinois to give me a $500 grant to go study utopian communities. I remember, I remember the suspicious look on the face of Professor Richard Burkhardt as he signed for the grant. He was like, the paper better be good, Mr. Patel. And I remember <laughs> like convincing my immigrant Indian parents that this was a real thing. I'm like, the university gave me a research grant. And my dad's like, you're driving through communes. What are you talking about? Like, um, and most of the communities I, I went to, about half of them were faith-based communities. They were Catholic workers and they were the evangelical version of Catholic workers. And so I remember being at a, a place called the Open Door Community, which is an evangelical Christian uh, radical Jesus style community with and for poor people in Atlanta. And there's like 30 people sleeping in the house. There's like 40 people sleeping in the backyard and Ed Loring and Murphy Davis. I don't think they would ever remember me. Like I was like a Brown kid who was there for like three days, right? Four days, but 25 years later, it had made such an impact on my life because, because I like see all these people who, you know, I, I would just think of as street people, like who are part of a community. And there's like such comfort. And it was, it's not that there wasn't some like tension and some kind of craziness, but, but Ed and Murphy like created a normalcy. Like it felt like it's just, you know, somebody's having a little bit of an episode over there human beings have episodes like that. That guy was in Vietnam. He, you know, he was an alcoholic for 12 years. What do you expect? We love him. And in 20 minutes, he'll be chopping the carrots for the soup kitchen. I'm like, you're going to give that dude a knife. <laughs> and Ed's like, he's been doing this here for 20 years. Wow. 
right? And it was so just like being there. And again, Ed and Murphy thought what they were doing was normal. They didn't think they were heroes. They were like, yeah, Jesus lived with, Jesus lived with everybody. We live with everybody. And I was so moved. I said to Ed Loring one night, I'm like, I want to come here. I want to come here next summer and live here. I want to like be a part of the open door community for three months. And Ed's like, you're not a Christian, are you? And I'm like, no. And he's like, hmm. And you're not interested in becoming a Christian. I'm like, yeah, you know, I have, I have a lot of admiration for you people, but I just like, it's just like the whole cross thing and like the blood. It's just, it's like, I don't think I... I don't think I can do that. I was on my own kind of spiritual search at the time, which would ultimately bring me back to Islam, as you well know, Brian. Uh, um, but I, 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 I loved the fruit and the tree wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. And what Ed said at that moment, and this is like the direct answer to your question, Pastor Tara, is he's like, you're, you're very welcome back here next summer. Mm-hmm. But here's my suggestion to you. Right? If you're not a Christian, and he's like, I've been watching you. Like, my job is to make Christians, right? So, like, somebody comes into this house and, like, I'm like, can I make a Christian? I've been watching you. And you're, you're so respectful during our prayers. And you kind of do your best mouthing the songs along. But I can kind of tell that you're a little bit of, a, of an angle to this tradition. And so that's fine. That's who you are. But we drink from the well of Jesus Christ and Christian faith. And this work is really hard. And if you don't drink from that well, it's going to be hard for you to sustain here for any, any period of time. So my suggestion to you is if you want to do this kind of work, go find the well that you drink from that will sustain. If it was Christianity, I'd love it. I'd love it. I'd do, do whatever I could to like get you, get you in our pack. But if it's not going to be, that's okay. Let's just be honest about it. But I'm going to tell you, you want to do like, this kind of work, you got to go find that well. Mm. And it was so beautiful, right? Because he had fully embraced his own well. There was none of this like, you know, everything is equal. Like he, he thought he, the, the water in his well was more pure. Mm. He wanted me to drink from it. But he also like had the perspicacity to say, I see you. And if this isn't going to be it, I'm going to be honest about that. Like, I, this isn't my first rodeo, you know? And by the way, there are other wells, right? Like, I, I might not think the water is as pure, but I know enough about the world to know that those wells have sustained other people. I admire those people. So go find your well, kid. It was, it was just like, it was so shaping to me about faith, which is one of the reasons that, like, I have never had a problem with exclusivism. You know, I dated a, 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 a Latter-day Saints woman in high school. Uh, uh, I had that experience with, with Ed Loring and the Open Door. Like, like I've, I've always experienced exclusivism. And of course, there's, there's exclusivists who are not like this. But I've always experienced uh, evangelicals and, and those of missionary stripe as people who have a deep, deep love and commitment for their own faith. They're perfectly honest about it containing the banquet. And, and I have in my experience, always found them respectful of, of people who are not going to do that. Yeah. Right. There are other experiences with, with, uh, um, you know, missionary types of all faiths. Mine have been principally positive. And I think part of it is I was, is that that was for, I was formed into a positive relationship by that moment with Ed Loring and Murphy Davis. Ibu, you've mentioned Catholic social teaching a couple times, and, and for me, as a, as a proud graduate of a Catholic college, I think about one of the reoccurring messages I heard during my time at Viterbo University was, what are the social implications of your theological affirmations? You know, how does this, how does this play out? How do you turn anger into action, into advocacy? In some ways, so the story you told a few moments ago about how do we turn from spectators to participators so I want to ask you something about social entrepreneurship. Yeah, It's something that's important here at Syracuse um, about how it is that students can see and seize opportunity in the context of limited resources in order to lead in service to the common good. That's what I think Interfaith Youth Corps is in many ways. 
the story of Interfaith Youth Corps from the back trunk of a car to basements of homes to doing a little better than that right now. So what message could you give to our students who want to turn their anger into action or see something wrong and want to do something about it as social entrepreneurs? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and so I'm going to answer the question directly. And then I'm going to say that, you know, talk a little bit about where I am on the journey because I'm, I'm 25 years from 1998 was 23 years ago. And IFYC has been a full fledged organization for 18 years since 2002. Right. So I'm, I'm at a different stage of my vocation, my calling, my career, but let me talk about the origin story for a second. So, so I would in some ways reference people back to those first two stories I told, which is, which is what do you want to be in the audience watching what other people put on the stage and looking for what's wrong with it? Or do you want to put imperfect things on the stage that move the world forward in what the Buddhist poet Gary Snyder called a millionth of an inch? Right. And I would rather I'd rather put imperfect things on the stage and try to move the world forward a millionth of an inch and learn from the critics and absorb, uh, absorb all kinds of feedback and then, you know, move another millionth of an inch. Right. And, and that, and the second moment of course is the, you know, me like raising a ruckus at all these interfaith conferences saying, you know, what was wrong, you know, too white, too male, too old, too boring. And you need more of this and this and this, more young people, more social action, more dynamism, more passion, more you know, diversity. And somebody's saying, that's a great idea. Mm. You should build that, mm. right? So I would say, what's that moment? And you, if somebody said, if, if during one of your critiques, somebody carved out a piece of it and said, that's a great idea you should build that. Mm. What would it look like? Mm. What would it look like? And how would you get it to work? Right. And so one of the, you know, people have, have make reference a lot to the Overton window, right. Which is a, uh, which is the, uh, 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 a metaphor for the range of possibilities that are, that are in the discussion. And the Overton window has shifted to the right since 2015, right? Like who, you know, I grew up thinking that, that Thomas Jefferson wrote the words immigrant nation into the Declaration of Independence, that that was like everybody agreed upon that, you know? I grew up thinking that like multiculturalism was an American ideal that, that um, we, we look back on and, and, and what, 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 where America had sinned and, and sinned and failed on that, everybody was... Uh, everybody was contrite and we were all trying to move. Well, you know, a set of people moved the Overton window to the right on that. And recently the Overton window has shifted to the left on questions like policing, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the thing about the Overton window. It's not just about, the Overton window doesn't just have width and breadth. It, it's, not, it, it's not just about what's in the range of discussion. It also has depth. What I mean by that is at some point people look into the Overton window and ask the question, does it work? Yeah. Does it work? So you critique the education system. Good for you, man. It is like critiquing the education system is the education system deserves critique. Can you run a school? Do you know how hard it is to run a school? Mm. right like do you can you articulate an educational philosophy recruit students hire teachers figure out what the school day looks like if, can you run it that's the does it work question yeah. right so so by the way i when i say that to people it is because I come with respect. It is, it, it is the, what Yolan Trevino did for me 
as a 23 year old in 1998, 22 year old, she said, you should build that. That showed me so much more respect than somebody who was like, boy, that's a brilliant critique. Somebody's like, man, that's a great, like that should be in the world. You should put that on stage. Mm -hmm. you, should put, you should put what you just talked about on stage. That's powerful. Right? So, um, and, and you know, the second half of this is, is I'm 20 years in, right? And you know what Jane Addams did at, when she hit 20 years at Hull House? Mm -hmm. She wrote a book called 20 Years at Hull House. And you know, you know what she did 20 years later? She wrote another book called 20 More Years at Hull House, <laughs> right? And so I am way past the original vision. It's still inspiring to me. And when I go to college campuses, that's mostly what people want to hear about for good reason, right? Like Brian, you, your principal goal is to kind of help the vocational formation of 18 to 22 year olds. Absolutely. That is a principal one, that is your calling right now, right? And so people want to hear about the original vision. And what my focus really is now is on how do you build an institution? Mm. How do you build an institution? And one of the interesting things is that, that if I'm honest with myself, in 2002, 2003, 2004, when IFYC was first lifting off, I principally... It, my image of it was as a platform for my public voice. Mm. Right? My image of social change was me at a microphone with a big audience. Right? That, that's what we're shown, right? The March on Washington, et cetera, et cetera, right? And what I say to my staff colleagues now is, my name is Interfaith Youth Corps. That's my name. And I'm obviously still happy to speak, right? But when people call me a prophetic voice, I'm like, eh, no, I'm an institutional leader. Mm -hmm. And actually there's very few prophetic voices in history. Most people who get called a prophetic voice are people with a big mouth and a lot of opinions. And I would much rather be somebody who says, I am about building something that I hope will last a long time after I leave, mm -hmm. right? That is about a group of people that comes together to enact a vision that they all feel like they have contributed to and they own. My friend, Matt, Matt Weiner, uh, um, who is your colleague at Princeton University, he's, the, oh, he's, he's, he's in the chapel there at Princeton. He, he and I, like, you know, he and I have been friends for a long time and he kind of heard the original vision of IFYC back in 1998 or 1999. I saw him at Princeton a couple of years ago and he said the geekiest thing to me, which is one of the highest compliments I've gotten, he said, you have, you have run the whole Weberian cycle, he said, right? You've gone from charismatic leader to bureaucratic leader, right? <laughs> I like the word institutional leader better, but that's, that's very much how I see myself now, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that I am building an institution and it's a different kind of work mm -hmm. than building a platform for my public voice. You talk about decades of work. Um, and in those decades, there are things that are beautiful, things that are broken, right? We experience great joys and great sadness. And of course, right now in real time, that's being experienced by so many in our country and our world. And I think it's in that vein that we received this question on Facebook from Keith Alford, who says, how do you maintain optimism when, which is so much a part of so many faith traditions? Um, how do you maintain optimism, or shall we say, I'll editorialize peace and serenity when there's so much evidence to the contrary? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, that, I think that I'm kind of wired optimistically. I think that's part of it. And I think, you know, I, I, love, I love my day to day. You know, Gwendolyn Brooks called live not, Gwendolyn Brooks says, live not for the end of the song, live in the along. Mm. I want to see the vision of pluralism enacted. I want to see the beloved community enacted, right? But I love my day to day. I love these kinds of conversations, right? I love working with my colleagues at IFYC. I love working with the young people we work with. I love, you know, uh, strategizing. I think, you know, my, my, my uh, metaphor for how the IFYC uh, a leadership team uh, especially works together is, is it's like being, it's like being a part of the Grateful Dead. It's like, it's like, uh, 
It's like a group of virtuoso musicians like playing around mm -hmm. in, in the studio or, or in somebody's backyard uh, uh, trying to create a beautiful song. Like I love that process, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I remember going back to my high school reunion a few years ago and, you know, like hearing in this, like, you know, I went to a wonderful public high school in the Western suburb of Chicago, suburb not unlike Arlington Heights, where you have some family, Brian. And, you know, a lot of conversations about like real estate deals and what houses people were building in Elmhurst, Illinois, and stuff like that. And I thought to myself, like, my God, like, I, I like, I, I, I had to listen to this stuff for like four years, you know? <laughs> And, and I like these people and, and I am so glad that I get to think about other things. Like for a, for a living, I think about things that I think about matters that matter yeah. and I get to engage in matters that matter. Yeah. And every once in a while, the match that you hold catches fire and every once in a while it burns you. And for most of it, you just got to keep holding it, you know? Until, as Seamus Haney says, hope and history rhyme, right? Once in a lifetime, the tidal wave, you know? Yeah. So, but if I didn't, if I didn't love the along, mm. I, don't, I don't know what I'd do. Mm. I wanted to follow up on that as we talked about a little bit before about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Another one, of course, main topics of conversation in higher ed is around health and well-being, especially here in the COVID era around students isolation, the search for meaning, all of these things coming together and we're witnessing another element of this public health crisis around mental health, shall we say spiritual health, emotional health. When you're thinking about the work of Interfaith Youth Corps and thinking about the context of our students, how is it that you think colleges and universities can best, shall we say, nourish and nurture the health and well-being of traditional 18 to 24 year olds today? It's a, I think it's a great question. Um, so I am very glad for the recent conversation on the costs of meritocracy, you know, Michael Sandel's book and other people's books. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm elite educated. I, I'm, I was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, right? But the funny thing is, if I had gone to the University of Chicago instead of the University of Illinois, I would have never been a Rhodes Scholar. Because at U of I, I had the room, it, it was a far less intense academic environment, which means, let's define what that means, I was a much less competitive with other students, hmm. okay? And being much less competitive, I could find space to figure out what really mattered to me. And the thing about a college campus is that it's full of people like you, Brian. It's full of people like you sit you know, you're in your office at Syracuse Chapel, hoping for some student to come in and say, I've really been thinking about what should matter to me. Like, that's what you exist for. That's what you, right? Like colleges are the most unbelievable places in the world. And to communicate to like 18 to 22 year olds or really like, you know, kids since the time they were four, like there are kids in New York City and Washington DC and San Francisco, who's like parents are trying to get them into the right daycare to go to the right preschool, to go to the right kindergarten. To go. I'm like, this is nuts. And so like, I don't really care where my kids go to college. And I actually really mean that. And I'm like from an immigrant Indian family and I went to Oxford, you know, now I want my kids to be their best. I want my kids to develop uh, a discipline about things that they care about. Like I tell my kids all the time that, that your identity isn't how much you talk about being a great basketball player. Your identity is how much you are willing to practice basketball, but I could care less what they actually achieve with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I just think like, like the cult of, narrow excellence has done way more harm than good. I really do, you know? Um, and I'm not putting my kids through that. And, and this is not about, I'm going to say it again. It's not about laziness. This is not about find your bliss. This is about develop the discipline of love for the things that you decide matter. And I have a bias on what those things are, 
you know, it's about intellectual life. It's about arts. It's about spirituality. I'm not much of an athlete. My kids both love sports. I encourage it. You, you want to, you want to be good at something, you know, that's, you know, like, I, but I'm, you know, like we know a guy named Robert who is just an expert crafts person uh, uh, in like woodworking and carpentry. And if like, he loves what he does and it's so obvious mm -hmm. and the excellence is so clear. And if my kids go that path, I'll be thrilled. Yes. You know, the, the, the cult of meritocracy has costs that outweigh the benefits. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I have, I have benefited mostly from it. You've mentioned a couple of times uh, the title of this program, Matters That Matter, and you've hit it right on the head about taking time for us to discuss matters that matter so our lives can be about matters that matter, especially in times like this. And when we talk about crisis, I think we talk about the consequences of crisis. We can talk about clarity. We can talk about building coalitions. We can talk about creativity, a number of different things that can be born out of crisis. And so as we come to the conclusion of our program here tonight. First, I want to thank you, Ibu, for being with us here with the Syracuse University community. We are so fortunate to have you with us. And for this final question, I want to ask you, what are you hoping can become more clear for our students uh, during this time where we're hoping that they can be discussing matters that matter, acting, in response to those matters that matter? If crisis can give birth to clarity, what is it that you are hoping can become more clear for our students? And again, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you, Brian. So I'm gonna leave you with two stories, okay? Um, uh, uh, there's a story of the Emperor Ashoka, right? Ashoka is known as the Buddhist emperor who creates one of the first, the earliest known civilizations that welcomes religious diversity and interfaith dialogue. Okay, uh, emperor in in uh, um, in the uh, in the in, of the Indian Indian subcontinent, but before Ashoka becomes that Buddhist emperor who welcomes religious diversity and is known for interfaith dialogue, he's a warrior king. And what changes him? So there's a story of Ashoka, uh, um, and maybe his name was different before this, right? And who knows if this is apocryphal or not? And I don't really care. It's a great story. There's, there's a story of him like uh, observing a, a great battle that he has set into motion and that his mighty armies are winning, okay? And he sees walking through this battle, a man with his eyes closed and his hands folded in total peace. And it's a Buddhist monk. And Ashoka observes this man and says, I want what he's got, mm -hmm. right? This mighty warrior king says, I'll give up my armies. I'll give up my territory. I'll give up. What does he, what allows him to walk through a battle unconcerned for his physical safety in a, you know, what, what we would call, what Christians especially would call a witness for a different way of living. And that is the story of Ashoka's conversion, right? And so I think to myself, like, like, you know, for 18, 19, 20 year olds, anybody, 69, 70, 71 year olds, right? What is that? Like, what is your version of that? Right? What is your version of that? And the story that I'll leave you with, and then, you know, we'll go dark. I know how these things go is uh, um, there's a story of St. Francis of Assisi who is tending his garden and somebody approaches and says, if the world were to end at six o'clock tonight, what would you do? And St. Francis says, I tend my garden. Do you, do you not think that what I'm, I think what I'm doing now is not the most important thing to me? Yeah. No. So what is, what does it look like to, to find an endeavor that matters so much to you that you would continue that is that is placid in nature, right? That you would continue doing it if the world were to end at six o'clock tonight. Eva Patel, thank you so much for being with us. To all of our guests here on the Zoom platform and also on Facebook Live, we know that we've put out some links in there. I highly recommend, if you haven't, go and check out Interfaith Youth Corps' website. They've been 
fantastic partners for us at Syracuse University. Eva, we very much look forward to working together far into the future. Um, thanks again to everyone, whether you're here in Syracuse, around the country, or around the world. Thank you for tuning in for Matters That Matter. We wish you a pleasant evening. We wish you all the best. Thank I appreciate you. you. Thank you. Thank you.